The year is 1830. France has just invaded Algeria. The Algerians begin to unite and fight back against the French under their emir, Abdel Qadr. He holds them off for 14 years before his situation becomes untenable. Amir Abdel Qadr then retreats into Morocco. What would you do as the Moroccan Sultan, Abdel Rahman? You would likely lose to France in a war, but you also don't want to be neighbors with these conquering colonizers. You decide to take in Amir Abdel Qadr and his army. After all, what's the worst that can happen? Boom, France just blew up your city. Boom, and another one. And boom, there goes another. You immediately sign a peace treaty with France and force Abdel Qadr back to what was left of his Algeria. France had made it clear that day in 1844 that they were not here to make friends. France also forces Morocco to give them this chunk of land on their eastern end. Three years later, in 1847, Amir Abdel Qadr finally surrendered to France. Morocco was now neighbors with not only France, but also Spain. There are two cities on the North Moroccan coast, one named Ceuta, the other Malia. Spain owns them both, and still does, and at this point, has for a few hundred years. Sharing land borders with European countries in the 19th century is just not where you want to be. Both of these colonial powers, one rising, the other waning, look to make a colony out of Morocco. Morocco's strategic position, acting as the northwestern gateway to Africa, was something to be desired. On top of these two untrustworthy neighbors, Sultan Abdel Rahman had his own internal problems to contend with. The most crucial of these being a devastating famine that had started in 1845. After six years and six bad harvests, the Moroccans were still starving. Some decided to take this matter into their own hands. In 1851, the Moroccan coastal city of Saleh would open fire on a French merchant vessel carrying supplies from Algeria. The Moroccans sank the ship and managed to capture some food so they wouldn't starve. The French saw this as an act of piracy and brought five ships to bombard Saleh. They end up hitting the 800-year-old Grand Mosque in the city. The Moroccans responded with gunfire back, managing to punch holes into two of the boats, killing a total of four French sailors. The bombardment of Saleh managed to destroy most of the coastal artillery and killed a total of 20 Moroccans. A treaty was then hurriedly signed by Sultan Abdel Rahman, who was forced to pay off the French with 100,000 francs. With this, Franco-Moroccan relations simmered back down to its usual uneasy, but peaceful. Sultan Abdel Rahman scrambled to find outside help. This he found in one of France's oldest enemies turned ally, the British Empire. In 1856, the Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship was signed. While it moved Morocco closer to the protection provided by the British Empire, it also weakened Morocco internally. It ended the Moroccan royal monopoly over the gold and guano trade. During the 19th century, Europeans were going crazy to acquire more guano. But what is guano exactly? Well, fossilized bat poop. Guano acted as the perfect fertilizer, and it just so happened that Morocco was full of it. Opening their borders to nearly all free trade with the British Empire ensured their safety, but also ensured a rising trade deficit. Three years later, in 1859, Sultan Abdel Rahman died at the age of 81. In the months prior to his death, the Spanish cities bordering Morocco, Ceuta and Melilla, started complaining about raids from the native Berbers from the Reef Mountains. Mid-negotiation, after finding out about the death of Sultan Abdel Rahman, the Spanish decided to drop the act and simply invade Morocco. They sent the new Sultan an impossible ultimatum that included ceding even more land to Spain in order to act as a buffer around the city of Ceuta. Sultan Muhammad IV, son of Abd al-Rahman, rejected. Spain immediately sent an army to Ceuta and defeated the Moroccan army after besieging the city of Tehuatan. So it was, only a few months after Sultan Muhammad IV's ascension, that he signed a treaty of peace with Spain. Both enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla would be given more of a buffer zone. The Spanish also received the Chafranas Islands, just east of Melilla. Much farther to the south, 
Morocco also ceded the city of Sidi Ifni to Spain. This was, however, a colonial return to the area for Spain. Nearly 400 years ago, the Lord of the Canary Islands, a man named Diego Garcia de Herrera, built a fort near Sidi Ifni. Herrera had married well, and through his wife, Queen Inez Peraza of the Canary Islands, he acted as her own personal general. Lord Herrera showed up in Morocco for two reasons. The proximity of Sidi Ifni when compared to the Canary Islands, and unfortunately, slaves. That's right, Sidi Ifni was a founding city of the early transatlantic slave trade. And now, in 1860, Spain reclaimed the same land. Worst of all for Morocco, they were forced to pay Spain an insane amount in war reparations. They put the 100,000 francs paid to France only 16 years ago to shame. Morocco now owed Spain a near unpayable 100 million francs. To ensure this payment, Spain held the city of Tehuatan until the 100 million francs were paid in full. The Moroccans would never regain this occupied city. To help finance this new debt was the British Empire, who was eager to loan Morocco more money that they could simply not pay back. Sultan Mohammed IV's first half year as Sultan was marked by war, but his whole 13 years after, that would be marked by near complete peace. Sultan Mohammed IV attempted to modernize Morocco, bringing in the first steam powered engines and printing presses into the country. He also attempted to modernize the Moroccan army. Other than this, Sultan Mohammed IV dedicated himself to a life of study. He would eventually die in 1873 and would be succeeded by his son, Sultan Hassan. And just like his father, the opening days of his reign would be consumed by war. Not from an outside power this time. Instead, there was a revolt directly in his own capital of Fez. Sultan Hassan quickly ended this rebellion. The Fez revolt showed him two pressing issues. One, Morocco needed to continue in its modernization policies, especially with the military. Two, Moroccan central authority was weak, and certain ethnic groups had far too much local autonomy. He worked on both of these things, increasing the central authority of his state. Six years into his reign, the British Empire occupied the town of Tarfeya in the south of Morocco. So much for that Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship, right? A year later, Morocco was forced to sign the Treaty of Madrid by its colonial predators, France, Britain, and Spain. This treaty formally ceded all Moroccan land under the occupation of these three colonial powers. What this really was, was a prelude to the Conference of Berlin that would occur in only five years. All the major European powers were there, and even the USA. The three-way race to colonize Morocco and the rest of North Africa was on. A year later, in 1881, on the other side of Algeria, France conquered the Beylik of Tunisia. The French quickly turned their hungry gaze towards Morocco. They occupied the eastern Moroccan territory of Tuat on the Algerian border. Sultan Hassan protested, but there was very little he could do besides prevent an all-out war. A year after this, on the opposite side of North Africa, the British Empire conquered Egypt. In that same year, the British also began to build a fort at the town of Tarfea that they had just occupied three years ago. Naming it after their queen, it would be called Fort Victoria, a further continuation of betrayal. In 1884, the main European powers, plus America and Japan, would attend the Conference of Berlin. This meeting would split nearly all of Africa between just a few European countries. Morocco would be split between France and Spain. But first, these countries had to conquer what was left. The Conference of Berlin would be formalized in 1885. Spain wasted no time. They would take what is now considered Western Sahara. Not shown on this map, as this is the conquest of North Africa, not West Africa. As the name implies, Western Sahara is pretty much a sandy wasteland. But now, it was Spain's sandy wasteland. This was the last straw for Sultan Hassan, but he didn't take it out on the Spanish. Instead, he attacked the British at their newly built Fort Victoria. The efforts of modernizing the Moroccan army seemed to pay off, as serious enough damage was inflicted on the fort 
to cause the British to evacuate the area. Later in that same year, Sultan Hassan was forced to use his army again, this time quelling another internal rebellion. With Spain's occupation of Western Sahara, some inside Morocco began to see the fragility of their country. The Sous people in the south, close to Western Sahara, revolted, but were quickly stomped out. A year later, in 1887, the Reef people in the north of Morocco also revolted. This was mostly put down, but the people of the Reef remained unhappy towards their sultan. In 1893, another rebellion towards the French-Algerian border broke out and around the city of Tafalat. Again, the modernized army of Morocco put this down. These are just a few of the largest of the revolts personally put down by Sultan Hassan. Morocco was so internally fractured that all 21 years of Hassan's reign, he would be on campaign. Sultan Hassan would die in 1894, leaving a much more internally united Morocco to be passed on to his 13-year-old son, Sultan Abdalaziz. He wasn't even the eldest of Sultan Hassan's sons, but his mother, a Georgian slave woman named Lila, was his favorite wife. The Grand Vizier, a man named Ahmad bin Musa, would act as a regent for the young Abdalaziz. After six years of regency under Grand Vizier Ahmad, he would die. The now 19-year-old Abdalaziz took on the full responsibility of Sultan. And boy was he happy about it. I mean, just look at that smile. A year after this, Abdalaziz was presented with his first challenge. France had started taking the remainder of what is now Algeria, firmly surrounding Morocco along with Spain. On top of this, France decided to formally annex the Tuat region of Morocco that they had occupied for the past 20 years. Abdalaziz did little. The people's trust in their young sultan began to wane. Further moves would be made by France, who chipped more away from the south of Morocco. The Moroccan locals fought back against the French. Abdalaziz simply looked the other way. To make matters even worse, another famine rocked Morocco and saw many starve in between the years of 1903 and 1907. Further discontent drew towards Abdalaziz. Some Moroccans decided to further show off this weakness. On May 18th of 1904, a man named Ion Perticaris, along with his wife and stepson, were taken hostage by the Jabala tribe of North Morocco. The leader of this tribe was a man who was known as Raisuli, and man does he look scary. Raisuli, although a hardened criminal, was something of a Moroccan Robin Hood. Taking families hostage and selling them for ransom money was just something that he did. But this time, it was different. Ion Perticaris was an American citizen, and his wife and stepson, they were British citizens. This hostage crisis would have went unnoticed had it not been an election year in America. An election year that featured sitting president Theodore Roosevelt, that is. Teddy immediately sent a squadron of American ships to get Perticaris back. You would think America would pay to get its own citizens back, but you'd be wrong. Instead, they threatened and forced Abdulaziz to pay the $2 million ransom in today's money. Rightfully so, the Sultan did not want to throw money away towards the hands of one of his greatest rivals. The American response was concise. Either you pay the ransom, or we take a field trip into Morocco to find and kill Raisuli. The Sultan folded and paid the ransom. The Americans also forced him to pay for their voyage to and from Morocco as well. America even forced Abdelaziz to make this bandit, Raisuli, a governor of the Jabala province. This, however, did not last long, as Raisuli continued in his piratical tendencies. Once again, Abdelaziz was bullied by external and internal foes. A few hundred miles away, one of the greatest rivalries in world history was becoming one of the strongest alliances in recent memory. I am, of course, talking about the British and French empires. On April 8th of 1904, both empires signed the Entente Cordiale. This was not as much of an alliance, rather than it was a scheme to equally split the majority of Earth between them. Among the many agreements in the treaty was an article about Morocco. Britain decided to completely remove themselves from Moroccan politics 
and leave the country to France's will. Since the Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship in 1856, the British Empire acted as Morocco's protector. Although they weren't very good at it, this treaty took at least some of the colonial heat off. The gate was now open for a total conquest. While well, they were open briefly, until a new European power protested. The rising German Empire was always trying to get in the way of their French rival. In fact, the whole conception of Germany as a unified country only came about after the Franco-Prussian War. The alliance of Germany's two biggest competitors left the nation state desperate to block any expansion of France's power. This would all culminate in 1905 in what was called the First Moroccan Crisis. On the last day of March in 1905, German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II arrived in the city of Tangier. Here, he gave a speech addressing that he, and Germany, would be the new protector of Moroccan independence. Sultan Abdelaziz couldn't be happier, immediately cutting all ties with France. A chance to play two predatory powers off one another was a chance Morocco literally could not pass up and still expect to be independent within a decade. France threatened to declare war on Germany, and then Germany backed off and agreed to attend the Algiricus Conference in 1806. Algiricus was a city in southern Spain. This conference was attended by a usual host of European colonial powers. So this was really more like a shakedown. Sultan Abdelaziz was basically being asked to hand over his entire country's tax base. By the end of the conference, Sultan Abdelaziz could not sign it. He walks away from the negotiation table. However, after two months, the Sultan agrees to the treaty. France immediately invades. In March of 1907, a French doctor named Emily Machamp was murdered by a mob in the city of Marrakesh. This is obviously terrible, but France decided to use this murder as an instigation for war. In just a week, France would begin their invasion of Morocco from Algeria. They captured the border city of Oujda, sitting on this initial victory for the better part of four months until the French made their next move. In July of 1907, the French Navy would continue in their tradition of bombing Moroccan cities. This time, they laid waste to Casablanca, leveling buildings, all for the death of one man. Thousands of civilians died as a result. For two days, the French bombed the 30,000 residents to the point of wide-scale evacuation. At the end of the carnage, a French Marine Corps lands to occupy the rubbled city of Casablanca, capturing it on August 7th of 1907. Sultan Abdelaziz was continuing to lose confidence with his people. At the same time, his brother, Abdel Hafid, seemed to be gaining support. If Sultan Abdelaziz was going to let European powers step all over him, maybe his brother wouldn't. The south of Morocco began supporting Abdel Hafid. Using his position of Khalifa of Marrakesh, given to him by his brother, he begins a coup. In February of 1908, he proclaims himself as the Sultan of Morocco, in direct opposition to Abdelaziz. Centering his control in Marrakesh and Fez, all he had to do now was wait for his younger brother to arrive. On August 19th of 1908, the fate of the Moroccan Sultanate would be chosen at the Battle of Marrakesh. This was less of a battle and more of an ambush. Sultan Abdelaziz would run to the safety of the French-controlled city of Casablanca, where he would abdicate two days later. With the seemingly pro-European Abdelaziz gone, it was time to see what the anti-colonial Abdelafid could do to prevent further conquest. One of the promises he made to his nobles before becoming the Moroccan Sultan was to recapture the occupied cities of Casablanca and Oujda. Politicians and promises usually don't go well together, and that's just the case here, as these cities would not be reclaimed by Morocco for decades to come. Realizing, as his younger brother had, that there was almost no use in fighting France and Spain, Abdallah Afid did little more than sit on his hands. Again, the only hope Morocco had for survival was to play the European powers off of one another. As French soldiers began encroaching deeper into Morocco, an old rival of France protested the move. 
as they had five years ago, Germany would intervene on behalf of Morocco. But only because Spain and France weren't sharing with them. This time, instead of simply promising to protect Morocco, they actually sent a warship to block French advancements. Negotiations between France and Germany began a week later. Unsurprisingly, Morocco was not even invited to discuss the sovereignty of their own country. With Britain mediating, Germany agreed to allow France and Spain to do what they wished in Morocco. In return, Germany was granted land in modern-day Cameroon to add on to their colony there. This political back and forth on two separate occasions can be viewed as one of the many contributing factors that led up to the soon-to-come World War I. In March of 1912, French soldiers occupied the extremely important city of Fès. Sultan Abd al was forced into negotiations with France. This treaty wouldn't take a chunk out of Morocco like previous ones had. Instead, France demanded that Morocco become a French protectorate. In name, Sultan Abd al would remain as a ruler, but in practice, he was now a colony of France. Abd al had done the opposite of what he had promised to do when he overthrew his brother to become the Sultan. Immediately after the French left, riots broke out in the streets of Fes. The Sultan was forced out of the city by the mob. He was later threatened to step down as Sultan by France, who granted him a large pension. In his place, the throne of Morocco sat vacant. In this vacancy, the son of a Moroccan guerrilla fighter would proclaim himself as Sultan continuing the Moroccan anti-colonial resistance. Much of southern Morocco, especially around Marrakesh, would side with Sultan Ahmed al-Hibba, who began to style himself as the Blue Sultan. Although dealing with a rebellious Sultan, France unofficially owned Morocco. Their promise to split the country between them and Spain would be fulfilled on November 27th of 1912. Meeting in Madrid, they signed a treaty that would give Spain the northern portion of Morocco, connecting the two cities that they already owned there. France was then granted the status of protecting power of Morocco, leaving them as the real ones in control. In August, France finally decided to put their own sultan on the throne, Yusuf bin Hassan, youngest brother of both previous sultans, a puppet ruler with no real power. However, in the south, the self-proclaimed Blue Sultan was still on the loose and was beginning to gain traction for his anti-imperialist cause. The French moved to firmly establish their foothold in the south, marching on the center of this rebellion, the city of Marrakesh. Sultan Ahmed al-Hibba and his resistance began targeting the French army by using hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. However, it was all for naught, as the French reached Marrakesh with only a handful of casualties. Defending the city against early machine guns and artillery, the Hibis, named after their leader Amid al-Hibba, stood no chance. 2,000 of the 10,000 Moroccans died, while another 2,000 were left wounded. The Blue Sultan was forced to flee, continuing the rebellion despite his setback. The French continued pressing to battle the self-proclaimed Sultan for the next two years. In 1914, the very same powers who had argued over Morocco, France, and Germany went to war. This was World War I, and it would mean a step back from less important matters in Morocco. This global conflict may have been a boon for the Hibis movement, but it spelled doom for many of the Moroccans already under French occupation. 40,000 Moroccans would be conscripted to fight on behalf of France and the Entente. They participated as early as two months after the start of the war and are featured in almost every major battle of the war, including Verdun and Artois. Over the four-year duration of the war, the Moroccans would suffer 10,000 casualties. Some of those who refused to join the French army instead began their own revolt. In roughly the middle portion of French Morocco, the Zayan Confederation of Berber Tribes was established. Formed after the alliance of three Berber tribes and led by one of their chiefs, Muha U Hamu Zayani. This rebellion split French Morocco nearly in half. Unsurprisingly, this Zion Confederation would find a natural ally in the Central Powers, especially Germany and the Ottoman Empire, who began supplying the Zion militarily. Now with two rebellions raging in their new protectorate, 
France began to send more soldiers, taking men away from the European theater. The Zion and French armies would give battle on November 13th of 1914, five months after the start of World War I. French Colonel René Lavardour took the initiative by ambushing the main Zion war camp. At first, this caught the Zion by surprise and led to a few hundred of them dying as they retreated to a nearby hill. Colonel Lavardour then looted the camp while the Zion leader, Chief Ziani, began to set his trap. The 1,200 men under Lavardour concluded their raid on the camp and began returning to the nearby fort that they garrisoned. The French column immediately encountered small bands of Zion. The column continued, but was reportedly suddenly set upon by 5,000 Zion warriors. They first targeted the exposed back of the column, where the bulk of the French artillery was located. They managed to encircle nearly the whole column and began the slaughter of the routing French as they ran all the way back to their fort. Nearly half of the force was killed, including Colonel René Lavardour. Lavardour kind of deserved this one. He made this bold move to attack the Zion camp without even asking permission from his superiors. Colonel Lavardour only left an ironic note stating that he was leaving to annihilate the Zion camp. The rest of the Zion War past 1918 was much of a foregone conclusion, as World War I had ended and France could shift full attention to this small confederacy that was no longer receiving arms from Germany or the Ottoman Empire. The rebellion still continued alongside the southern uprising of Amid al hiba the Blue Sultan. After nine years of fighting the French in a guerrilla war, the Blue Sultan would pass away at the age of 41 due to a sudden illness. His title and failed dynastic coup would be passed on to his brother, but he would never gain anywhere near the support that Amid al hiba had inspired. Now Morocco only had one, albeit puppeted, sultan. The Zion War struggled along until 1921, finally falling to French conquest. However, as one rebellion faltered, another was forming in the north of Morocco. The area, known as the Reef Mountains, occupied by the Spanish Protectorate of Morocco, declared their independence and organized a government called the Republic of the Reef. Its president was a man named Abdelkrim, a soon-to-be master innovator of guerrilla warfare. <laughs>